Hi everyone, Justin Jolene here with another issue of the Running Specialist Report. And today we're talking about gluteal tendinopathy. Now many of us have prescribed sideline hip abduction for patients and runners with gluteal tendinopathy early in rehabilitation. The problem is that sideline hip abduction just doesn't generate enough muscle force to be an effective strengthening exercise to recover from gluteal tendinopathy. So what are we using instead? Well, instead we're using body weight exercises. Exercises like split squats should be used much earlier in rehabilitation because they're going to be supported by very new evidence which shows that the muscles are better recruited and generate more force in weight-bearing exercises. Now, why is this the case? Well, let's examine that sideline hip abduction exercise that we referenced earlier. Sideline hip abduction actually does isolate the gluteus medius quite well. However, what happens is that it actually overly shortens the gluteus medius during the exercise. That amount of shortening, that contraction, then produces less muscle force. So what we're actually seeing is the body weight exercises are able to keep an optimal tendon length. And that is going to generate more muscle force and ultimately be better for strengthening the gluteus medius. Now, practitioners treating runners with gluteal tendinopathy really do need evidence-based exercises to be able to strengthen the gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, and gluteus media minimus. Now, new research is now ranking the eight most common hip exercises based on their gluteal force production. I'll get into those rankings, but first let's talk about the clinical pearls we'll go over today. So first, open chain hip abduction is a low value exercise. It's ineffective. Now, progressive loading exercises, which we'll talk about, are very effective, and they're going to be using weight bearing, and they're going to be able to strengthen the gluteus medius and recover from gluteal tendinopathy. Now, once you're going through that course of gluteal tendinopathy rehabilitation, then we're getting to the end stages and determining if that patient and runner is eligible to start a return to run plan. Now, using high-intensity functional tests are going to be really helpful for those patients to be able to determine, determine whether they can go back to running. And then lastly, what are some of the other types of treatments and interventions we can use for gluteal tendinopathy? Well, PRP injections are quite good and effective, but we're really only using them for chronic gluteal tendinopathy cases and if conservative measures are not working. So let's go over what the eight most common hip exercises are for gluteal tendinopathy. And if you want to learn more, check out the link of the descriptions. It will describe each of these exercises in a little more detail. However, let's go over these eight so we can see them. So you can see many of these are body weight focused. There's not many that are not body weight focused. In fact, I'll isolate and show you the only one is the sideline leg raise or the sideline hip abduction, you can see that is still going to isolate the gluteus medius, but again, it's overly contracting it. It's not going to produce good muscle force. So we can see single leg squats are on this list, split squats are on this list, a lot of hip extension dominant exercises, single leg Romanian deadlifts, single leg hip thrusts, and then we have the band sidestepping, the hip hikes, and the side planks, and I already mentioned the sideline uh, leg raises. So what does the new research say for gluteal tendinopathy and how can we get patients to recover? Well, it's really using this concept of progressive loading exercises. We want to slowly build the patient's tolerance to higher and higher gluteal muscle forces. And while these can be any contraction type, eccentric, concentric, any, con any um, uh, contraction type, it's essential for clinicians to understand the four tiers from low to high muscle load. Now, also important to note is that progressive loading exercises are specific for the muscle you are working to isolate. For example, the gluteus maximus is going to have a different progression than the gluteus medius and gluteus minimus. And to create an appropriate and evidence-based plan of care, clinicians should use their objective findings to be able to apply them to their patient and identify which muscle is affected by tendinopathy and then use that progression to progress them back to 100% and back to running. Now, since the gluteus medius is the most often affected tendon and muscle by gluteal tendinopathy, it's often the focus of muscle strengthening, and that's what we'll go over. So clinicians really do need to know an evidence-based progression for gluteus medius exercises from lowest to highest muscle forces. So I've made this chart here so that you can see it a little bit better. And I want to isolate and I want to show a couple things on this chart here. 
So you can see the gluteus medius lowest muscle forces, as we talked about before, that sideline leg raise, while it still isolates the gluteus medius, it is very, very low. We also then go towards hip hike and split squats. Identify here that BW means body weight. That's going to be the abbreviation. So those are body weight, hip hikes, and split squats. Now, progressing from the lowest to the low gluteus medius muscle forces, we can then see sig single leg hip thrusts with body weight, sideline leg raises with 12 repetitions max resistance. As you can see here, even with 12 repetitions max resistance, we are still only in the low category of muscle forces for the gluteus medius. That is not a lot. You can see above that is single leg RDLs with body weight. And then we're going to progress even higher. And these are going to be really the exercises that are going to help those patients get back to the prior level of function, things like running and all that great stuff. So here we can see single leg squats, really good body weight. We can also see banded side stepping with 12 repetition max resistance, hip hikes with 12 repetitions max resistance, single leg hip thrusts with 12 repetitions max resistance, and then split squats with 12 repetitions max resistance. Let me take a moment to talk about that 12 repetitions max resistance. That is an individual external load. So basically this can be weight. This is a force applied to these patients and it's really judged by what is their level of 12 repetitions max. So we're not saying 15 pounds, 20 pounds, 30 pounds, whatever it is. We are specifically saying whatever their 12 repetitions max volume is. And that is individually for each patient and runner. And then lastly, the highest gluteus medius muscle forces. These exercises are going to be your single leg RDLs with 12 repetitions max, single leg squats with 12 repetitions max. And I want to identify the single leg squats. You'd think this is single leg squats. How hard can they be? They really get that much gluteus medius force? Yes, absolutely they do. And then the highest one in body weight side, line, or side planks. So a couple of important things to note here with this graph. As you can see, it orders everything so you can get the most progressions and the best load for your patient. However, there's a couple other things I want to identify that are important when we're thinking about loading up the gluteus medius and recovering from gluteal tendinopathy. Now, many of these exercises, as you can see, are performed in weight bearing like I've mentioned before. That sideline hip abduction is still in that list, but remember, it overly shortens that muscle. So there is fairly low value in doing that. Now, those weight-bearing exercises, as I mentioned before, they are hip extension dominant. Now, these exercises have emerged as particularly useful for gluteal tendinopathy. The reason why is because these exercises, and as I mentioned them before, split squats, RDLs, hip thrusts, they're all able to generate a lot of gluteus medius muscle force. That's because they're staying in an optimal muscle length. They're keeping the tendon from getting overly shortened during contraction. However, important to note, resistance bands alone are probably not going to give you enough external resistance or external load. You will need to really progress these patients that want to get back to running to using 12 repetitions maximum resistance, and that's really what's going to be indicated and most beneficial for the recovery. However, even as patients are going through a course of care, clinicians are still struggling to be able to make informed return to run decisions. There's a lot of ambiguity from getting to the end of gluteal tendinopathy rehab and then getting patients back to running and successfully back to the amount of running they want to do. Now, running experts agree functional performance testing is really, really important, and that's what's going to help you determine your return to run eligibility. Now, as a reminder, these tests should all be focused on hip stability. They should be focused on the strength of the gluteus medius. And all tests should be ranked or calculated using an limb symmetry index. If you want a review on the limb symmetry index, check out our previous return to run uh, webinar. It goes over it in great detail, and I'm happy to send a link if you send me a message. So all these should score over 90% on the limb symmetry index index prior to initiating a return to run program. However, know that there are low, medium, and high intensity functional tests. And this is a problem we've seen that has just now starting to be addressed in the research. There's low, medium, and high intensity functional tests. As you can see here on this graph, there's many different special or, uh, 
functional performance tests that you can do. And you can see like a timed single leg stance test might be really good to determine if someone has acute symptoms of gluteal tendinopathy, but not the most effective to be able to determine if someone's ready to return to run. So if you want to learn more about each of these functional performance tests and how to complete them, check out the link. It'll send you to the page and a great research study that will go over them in more detail. But I want to highlight two in particular here, and that is going to be the hop lunge test and the medial slash lateral triple hop test. These are going to be high intensity tests, and these are going to be better ones to be able to evaluate patients ready to return to run. Also note here that the medium tests or medium intensity tests, the single leg squat and step down tests can also be effective, but we want to make sure that we are getting a data point and understand that there's higher intensity tests out there that you can perform. Also, there is the Y balance and many other tests that you can use. These are just an example of a couple. There's also agility tests and left tests that you can use. So keep in mind that while this is just some of the performance testing you can do, there's many, many, many other ones out there. And lastly, what are some of the other treatment options that you can use other than exercise? Well, Progressive loading exercises are going to be your first treatment for patients with gluteal tendinopathy, which is really good. We see research supporting that over and over and over again. And for the last six, seven years, we've seen that emerge and now be validated multiple times. And we're excited to see this progression coming out of what progressive loading exercises actually look at like and specific exercises you can do. However, if it is not working for the patient and the patient's not getting better, platelet-rich plasma injections, or PRP, can be a really good effective treatment for grades 1 and 2 gluteal tendinopathy. However, cortisone injections are not so effective. They provide that short-term relief, but they worsen long-term outcomes because, unfortunately, they degenerate the injected tissue, and unfortunately, while they do have some anti-inflammation and they do help in short-term pain relief, they don't have a good long-term outcome. Extracorporeal shockwave therapy or shockwave, we are definitely seeing studies showing some benefits here. However, really more research is needed to validate these findings. And this goes for a lot of tendinopathies like patellar tendinopathy and um, many other tendinopathies you'll see in runners. Dry needling, which a lot of people will do, has been shown to be effective. However, it's usually done in conjunction to progressive loading exercises. And we still see that our first line of defense is progressive loading exercises. And then if it's failing, we are progressing patients to PRP injections. However, it doesn't mean that dry needling can't be used with these patients. We just want to make sure we're using those progressive loading exercises as well. And then lastly, surgery. We never want to send a patient to surgery or get a surgical consult, but if conservative management is failing, we can consider both endoscopic and open gluteal repairs for the gluteus medius because we are definitely seeing good outcomes there. Now, in summary, I want to break down just some of the common and big points that we went over today. Those open chain hip abduction exercises are a low value, ineffective exercise. We instead want to use progressive loading exercises with body weight, 12 repetitions maximum resistance, and that's going to be effective for gluteal tendinopathy. Now, those weight-bearing hip extension dominant exercises are particularly useful for gluteal tendinopathy, and as we can see, evidence is suggesting that split squats, RDLs, and hip thrusts are all able to generate high amounts of gluteal muscle force. However, we also want to prescribe this individually for each patient, and if the patient has more glute max symptoms or glute min symptoms, we want to differentiate and progress the different um, progressions of muscle uh, loading for each of those muscles in each of those tendinopathies. And then we also see that clinicians making return to run decisions should be using those high intensity functional tests. Those are quite valuable, including the hop lunge test and medial lateral triple hop test. And then lastly, Evidence is supporting progressive loading exercises as a first treatment. However, if conservative management is failing, PRP injections are considered and they are certainly effective. Lastly, I just want to go over all the references that I used here and I want to make a specific call out here to the first research study. Really, really helpful in showing these progressions and uh, showing the progressive loading exercises. So if you're interested, use that link, check out that study. It can be a really effective tool. Until next time, take care and please let me know if you have any questions or want to talk about anything in this report. Have a great day.